face from an aircraft that you can spin up violently. And that's what we were there to prevent. The second jump went perfect. And then the third jump was 102,000 feet. Now, there was a big difference psychologically between the 76,000 feet because I felt that if the pressure suit failed, that I had some chance of survival. That if the pressure suit failed, the face plate blew out or something, that I might be able to get down alive. But I knew at 102,000 feet, if the pressure suit failed, that I was dead. You know, that psychologically, there's a big difference. Because <laughs> there's, there's no backup when you're in a pressure suit and that pressure suit fails. Uh, when I got there, uh, I drifted for 11 minutes. Now, the, the balloon could not go any higher than the ceiling altitude. Our objective was to be at 100,000 feet. We were actually at 102,800 feet. I stood up and I said a prayer. I said, Lord, take care of me now. And I'll tell you, that was the most fervent prayer I ever said in my life. <laughs> and with that, I pushed the button and I jumped. And uh, I free fell for uh, four minutes and 36 seconds before the main parachute opened. And uh, of course, with the main parachute open, the rest of the jump is anticlimactic. <laughs> but we demonstrated that we could provide a means of escape from high altitude. The escape system that we developed back 47 years ago is still being used today. Every aircraft that flies today has a small drogue chute that we developed in our program back in 1959-1960. That's not only our Air Force and Navy, but also the Russians use the same escape techniques we developed back in 1949-1960. So we did contribute to uh, the air crews for the last 47 years. I then did another program uh, with a telescope and an astronomer went up to 87,000 feet and I looked at the earth, uh, at the heavens and the planets above the earth uh, without the haze and turbulence of the atmosphere. And that was a fascinating program. Unfortunately, Dr. Stapp had left and we only got to make one flight on that series. And uh, I then went to uh, Vietnam. I had three tours in Vietnam. Uh, the last tour, I flew F-4s, uh, and uh, I shot down a MiG in 1972, and then uh, about uh, two months later, the world's greatest fighter pilot on the other side shot me down. <laughs> and I was a POW for 11 months. And I say the Hanoi Hilton, and I'll tell you, that was a crappy Hilton. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, this was terrible. Room service was horrible. <laughs> Staff 
and the great team members that I had to work with, and the great mechanics that made my airplanes fly, and the, uh, the, the teamwork that I've always been able to, to, to gather around me. Uh, but it's been, a, it's been a great trip. And I hope that I've shared with you some of the excitement and the, and the fun that I've, I, that I've had in, in, my, uh, in my life. And now, now I'll jump back to ask some questions, please. Do I have the lights on so I can see who's asking questions? <laughs> Any bottles coming my way? <laughs> okay. I have two questions. Boy, that's a pretty good talk. I might get one question. Try something else. Uh, how about the, uh, the development of the drug shoots and all that? I'm just curious in terms of things like the Mars lander. Uh, did they use uh, parachutes of some sort? Or do you know anything about that? Uh, yeah, so they're using the type of parachute system for Mars. Uh, they, they, they've used parachutes for landing on those. Uh, but the parachute that we used was uh, just to, to give uh, reduce uh, the, the velocity just enough to give stabilization. And, uh, and it worked. Mm -hmm. But they are using parachutes for Mars uh, uh, vehicles. Landing well, okay. The other question. So, so the uh, first time you, uh, you jumped, you, you had problems signing up. Do you, you know what happens? Uh, why that happen? Yes, uh, there's an old adage that said, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And one of my crew members, uh, we had a box at my kit. The kit I had on me uh, weighed 60 pounds, and they had an auction equipment, cameras, and batteries, and regulators, and all kind of stuff. And this kit sat in a box with styrofoam. And around the perimeter of the box were water bottles to make a heat sink so, keep the, so the kit would not get so cold. And we'd use that uh, box in a 100 altitude junior test. The same box worked perfect. And I'd go to 100,000 feet and I'd stand up and I'd go through the checklist and I would simulate jumping out of the mountain. And uh, on this, the day before the jump, my crew member looked at this box, he said, you left it, we look crappy. So he built a new one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the uh, box was a little bit too small, and as I went along, the, the water bottles froze and expanded and locked me like a vice in this uh, seat. And with my thrashing around, and I, I was really worried because I had a hell of a time getting out of that seat. And I didn't want to come down that gondola. And uh, when I jerked, as I was fighting to get out of the seat, I pulled this timer inadvertently. The timer was not supposed to go off until 16 seconds. But when but I was thrashing about, I inadvertently started that timer going. And, uh, and when, I, when I stepped out of the gondola, instead of free falling for 16 seconds before this small shoot over, I only fell for two and a half seconds. And lacking velocity, it wrapped around my neck, and uh, it could not deploy. Uh, but uh, it was it wasn't no fault of anybody. Just no, if it's not broke, don't fix it. But, uh, <laughs> we uh, we survived that that because of the genius of the people that were working with me. Uh, once again, I when I did this, and by the way, someone will beat that record someday. But when they do, remember that when we did that work, we didn't do it to set a record. Uh, it's been a record now for 47 years, but we did do it to set a record. We did it gather from the community for our space program. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be here. Joshua, thank you again for inviting all